I would imagine if you've been to the grocery store recently, you've noticed that things are more expensive. Gas is more expensive. It doesn't matter where you live in this country, things are more expensive. The economy, our economic future is uncertain. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what is it that we can do to protect our financial future for our families, for our children? What can we do personally? Uh, One of the things I would recommend is at least considering adding gold and silver into your IRA, your investment accounts. Take a look, figure out how to do that and see if that is the right fit for you. The place that you can start is with Lear Capital. Call Lear Capital and you can get their free precious metals investor guide. You can also ask them about their Lear Advantage IRA that lets you transfer or roll over your old 401k or IRA into a gold and silver tax advantage IRA. Plus Lear is offering right now Crazy shipping, uh, free shipping, and up to $15,000 in bonus gold or silver with a qualified purchase. This is something you at least need (laughs) to take a look at. You can call for details, 800-489-6450. Lear Capital is the most rated precious metals company on consumer affairs with a near perfect rating on Trustpilot. Call them at 800-489-6450. That is 800-489-6450. Calling that number, you will get your free kit and there you will learn how gold has performed during periods of inflation government debt interest rate hikes economic crashes even wars and how in all of those gold has been the financial bedrock asset in portfolios Uh, one of the things i love about lear capital is that they are an american-owned company proud to do business with americans that share conservative values write this number down 800-489-6450 call them today or if you don't want to call you can click the link below in the show description and the show notes check them out you will do yourself a great service by at least investigating lear and what they have to offer hello and welcome to the situation report today very glad to have you joining me my name is jeremy stonlicker and this is the show where we do our very best to give you the information and perspectives you need to navigate an ever-changing culture. Let me ask you a question as we begin today. Do you ever look around at what's happening in the world and ask yourself this question? How did we get here? (laughs) Have you ever done that? Uh, I know I do. In so many issues, so many areas, um, we often talk on this show about cultural issues and what's happening in the world and how it's happening and why it's happening. And we bring guests on to illuminate uh, exactly what is going on. But I look at issues and, and I think of some of the issues going on right now that we're addressing and we talk about uh, things like critical race theory. How in the world did we get here? When we look at all of the gender issues that that we talk about and that we're dealing with, how did we get here? You've heard me ask this on shows before. How did we get to the point where uh, we are taking children to drag shows? How did we get here? How did we get to the point where Christians are being pushed out of the public square and public conversation, where even as I talked about a few weeks ago, a Supreme Court justice is being asked to recuse herself because she is a Christian? How in the world did we get here? Uh, again, so many other issues we could ask that question about. And when we look at culture, uh, we do sometimes have to just step back and go, what in the world? How did we get here? Uh, that's an important question to ask. I would most often suggest that instead of asking, how did we get here? We need to ask the question, how do we move forward? But understanding how we got to where we are in so many ways, helps us to navigate our way forward. When we look at the, the, the issues that are the big issues of the day, today, in our culture, in our society, understanding the path that was taken, the decisions that were made to bring us to the place where we're now asking these questions is important. And it's not important because we want to dwell on the past. It's important because the past, in so many ways, informs our future. If we know how we got here, then we can know how to move forward so that we can find ourselves in a different place in the future. A pastor who writes on church growth and church processes made a statement in one of his books. It's something like this. I'll paraphrase that if you don't know how you got to where you are as a church or as an organization, then even if it's a good place, if something goes wrong, and it inevitably will, 
you won't have any idea how to fix it. If you don't know the steps that were taken along the way to get you to where you are, even if you're in a good place, well, when things change and something goes wrong, you won't know how to get back to the place that was good. Um, that is the same of things that aren't so good. If you don't know the process that was taken to get you to the place where now you're dealing with these issues, then you have no idea what to do going forward. When I think about our country and more specifically, not just the United States, but the, the world, when I think about the issues that the world is dealing with, when we think about wars, when we think about genocide, the millions and millions of folks that have been murdered because of political ideologies in places like the former Soviet Union, in places like China, uh, in places like Southeast Asia, when we think about the millions of folks who have been murdered over political ideologies, it's important for us to understand what took place before those ideologies took root and people took action. I look at the United States right now and I look at many of the overtures that our government is making, uh, even coming out of the COVID era and coming out of uh, lockdowns and government overreach and uh, governments, whether it was the government of the United States or state governments, local governments, uh, doing things that in the past would have been considered absurd we have a constitution. We should be protected from these infringements on our rights. And yet during a time of so-called emergency, these rights were trampled and leaders were doing things that had not been done in the United States in the past. We asked the question, how did we get here? I think we can look to historical precedent and understand decisions that are made in the past in so many ways impact our present. I've talked about this briefly um, in other episodes of the Situation Report. Uh, I, I consider history and historical perspective and a knowledge of history to be very, very powerful. Not just in your personal life, if you know your family history and you know your own history and background and you understand where you've come from, you'll have a better idea of how to move forward. But nationally, why is American history so important? We have to know where we came from. We have to understand the intent of the founders of our country so that we can uh, get back on track when we get off, so we can stay on track when we're there. But understanding globally decisions that were made and how they impact us today gives us the perspective we need to either reinforce those decisions as having been good or dismantle, <laughs> unwind those decisions and get to a place where we really need to be, a place where we can experience the freedom uh, that we were created by God to experience. I want to read an article to you. It's uh, a couple of years old, but it's a, a fantastic article. It gives a great overview of the decisions that were made during World War II between primarily our president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin, the, the president premier of Russia at the time of the Soviet Union. I want to read this article because, again, it illustrates how decisions made in a moment of crisis have led to the murder, literally, of millions of people uh, around the world since that time. I've spent a lot of time recently reading uh, on World War II, read an incredible uh, book um, um, uh, last couple of months, I guess. I was trying to think of exactly when, but the last couple of months. Uh, when you read a lot of books, you forget when you read them. But Sean McMeekin, who I've interviewed on this show before, uh, wrote a book entitled Stalin's War, and it's a deep dive into Joseph Stalin's strategy around World War II and even implicates him in stoking the flames of war so that Europe could be reframed and redrawn the way that he wanted it. Uh, but these decisions made at a moment of crisis and now impacting us today around the world. I want to read this article to you. It was written by Richard uh, Ebling. It uh, can be found, among other places, on the website, the American Institute for Economic Research, written in January of 2020. And I go back a couple of years, but this is uh, what is known as evergreen content and historical content. 
and applies more now probably today than even when it was written. <clears throat> so let me read. He begins by saying, 75 years ago, uh, during the week of February 4th through the 11th, 1945, the most important Allied conference during the Second World War was held at Yalta on the Crimean Peninsula in the Soviet Union between U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. Their decisions determined the fate of tens of millions of people around the world with important residues remaining even today, three quarters of a century later. I want to pause real quick. Uh, I'll get back to the article. But even in this first paragraph makes some important points. Their decisions determined the fate of tens of millions of people around the world. That's the first point. If we look at our elections and say they don't matter, <laughs> that is very short-sighted thinking. When we elect someone into public office, particularly when we talk about the president and our national politics, we are electing people into office that will potentially make decisions that can impact the lives of millions of people across the United States and on an international stage, impact the lives of millions and millions of people around the world. That's exactly what's happening in this article. He said their decisions determine the fate of tens of million pe millions of people around the world with important residues. This is the second important thing he says here. Important residues remaining even today, three quarters of a century later. Decisions that are made will have, he calls it residue, ramifications for generations to come. We don't get away from that. Uh, I, I've made the point a number of times that I believe many of the areas of overreach by the federal government, even in the last couple of years when we've looked at COVID, are the result <laughs> of decisions that were made by another president a long time ago, during a moment of national crisis where he determined and convinced at the time Congress to go along with, he determined that federal overreach was necessary because of the level of national emergency. President Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, instituted overreach from the government in ways that had never been done before. We could argue whether that was good or bad or otherwise. What he did, though, was set a precedent that other governments and other presidents, we'll see FDR here in a moment, but our president in the last couple of years and our government in the last couple of years, President Abraham Lincoln set the precedent that's been followed since then, over 100 years. So decisions made at a moment in time have generational impacts. We've got to be very careful about expedience, about pragmatism, about making decisions uh, that are expedient right now, but may have larger ramifications later. Let me continue reading the article. For eight years, beginning in 1937, the battle lines of war had been engulfing much of Asia, most of Europe, parts of Africa, and even touched the shores of North America. As many as 50 million people may have died in this devastating global firestorm of conflict. The war also marked a descent into a nightmare of human barbarism. The Nazis slaughtered millions whom they classified as racial vermin. Those innocent human beings were to be eradicated from the face of the earth in a deluded pursuit of engineering a master race. Never had humanity witnessed such a magnitude of designed magnet, uh, madness. By the beginning of 1945, it became increasingly clear that both Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan would be defeated, and the agony of war would finally end. The weary world longed for peace, security, and freedom. The future, everyone understood, was in the hands of the political leaders of the victorious United States, Great Britain, and Soviet Union. During that week of February 4th through the 11th, 1945, the Big Three met at Yalta to map out the post-war world. Now think about this. Again, if you're not a history person per se, maybe you haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this. I have spent... Uh, more than I should time thinking about this. And I get, I get mad every time I think about it, to be honest with you. Um, when I think about Franklin Delano Roosevelt and I believe how he was manipulated by Joseph Stalin and the war, uh, the, the post-war world that was drawn by them, uh, it is maddening. Um, I wrote a, read another book earlier this year 
that deals specifically with the couple of years following the end of World War II and the terror that the Soviet Union brought, particularly on Germany and into Poland and other places um, when they were given the opportunity to do so because of what happened at the Alta Conference. Uh, I think about these things, but, but, but think about what's happening here. Three men sat down and redrew, literally redrew the Europe <laughs> and the countries of Europe into areas that would be controlled by themselves. Now, Great Britain and the United States would eventually relinquish uh, political control. That was part of the design, and Russia would much, much later, after much devastation. I'll continue reading. He, stop, he talks first about Churchill and Roosevelt. Winston Churchill was in the weakest position of the three. He had led the British people through four years of war, standing alone for a year against the Nazi war machine after the fall of France in June of 1940. Britain was financially and militarily exhausted by 1945. Thus, FDR and Stalin were really the ones to determine mankind's destiny. Roosevelt, though in poor health, had just been elected for an unprecedented fourth presidential term. His New Deal policies beginning in 1933 brought about a colossal expansion in federal power, spending, regulation, and control over virtually every facet of American life. Despite a setback in 1935 when the U.S. Supreme Court declared most of his economic planning schemes unconstitutional, uh, does that sound familiar at all, by the way? Um, presidents overreaching, the Supreme Court saying it was unconstitutional, and then the president going on anyhow. But I digress. Back to the article. FDR continued on the path of big government through a vast array of interventionist and welfare state policies. He had transformed the traditional American republic almost beyond recognition. When war came, first in Asia between Japan and China, beginning in July 1937, and then in Europe following the German invasion of Poland on September 1, 1939, FDR took on a new mantle of authority. New Deal Savior of the World, violating numerous neutrality acts that the Congress had passed and which he had signed, Roosevelt bent the Constitution to edge America toward war long before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. The brutal, war, uh, the brutal World of Joseph Stalin is the next section. He says, Stalin felt stronger than ever at the Alta Conference. In the eyes of Western leftists, the Soviet Union offered the hope of a bright socialist tomorrow, where toiling workers ruled in place of capitalist profit mongers, and want and worry were to be vanished through the miracle of government central planning. In the early 1930s, FDR said that he admired the fact that the Soviet people, quote, all seem really to want to do what is good for their society instead of, like Americans, wanting to do for themselves, end quote. In 1945, when he came back from the Alta Conference, the president told members of his cabinet that he found in Stalin's nature, quote, the way in which a Christian gentleman should behave, end quote. Now, I want to stop there for a second. <laughs> FDR said that he saw in Stalin's nature the way a Christian gentleman should behave. This is, it's fascinating, and to understand whether or not it's it was actually his perspective, or he was propping up Stalin for some other reason. It's impossible to know. But know who Joseph Stalin is, was. Joseph Stalin, before the Alta Conference, had already been responsible during the Holodomor um, incident in Ukraine. He was responsible for the starvation and murder of more than 10 million Ukrainians. It's hard to know exactly how many. Um, he was responsible for that. <laughs> um, a, a forced genocide, a forced famine, yeah. unbelievable and unprecedented in history. He was responsible for the murder of thousands of Polish citizens and military officers. He was responsible for millions of individuals, political prisoners, um, those who were opposed to his regime, others, millions murdered within his own country. Joseph Stalin, we know, would later murder more than 6 million folks in the Soviet Union. Uh, this is in addition to all the other atrocities. Uh, that, along with starvation, along with a life of imprisonment for many in places like Siberia, this is Joseph Stalin. And this 
by the way, was not unknown to FDR. He knew at least about what had happened prior to World War II, certainly prior to 1945, and chose to overlook that. Chose to prop up a communist dictator who was bent on taking over Europe and did, in fact, take over much of Europe, who eventually would take over much of China, who is the reason communism is in control in China, who is the reason communism is in control in northern uh, uh, in uh, North Korea, who is responsible for what happened in both Cambodia and Vietnam. That Stalin is the Stalin that FDR would call someone who act in a way uh, that is consistent with uh, which Christian gentlemen should behave. Unbelievable. Uh, he goes on in his article. That was my commentary. He goes on in the article. This Christian gentleman was, in fact, Hitler's competitor in brutality and mass murder in the 20th century. A bank robber on behalf of the Russian socialist movement from before the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, Stalin proved a master of political intrigue. After Lenin's death in 1924, he succeeded in destroying all of his rivals and rose to absolute power in the Soviet Communist Party and government. He let nothing stand in his way of implementing the socialist society ordering comprehensive central planning and total collectivization of the land in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Stalin quashed all peasant resistance through forced famines, torture, terror, and exile to the vast wastelands of Siberia and Soviet Central Asia. Between 9 and 12 million people perished in the process of imposing the collective farming system. In the 1930s, he turned his ruthless power against imaginary, quote, enemies of the people. Mass purges and show trials sent millions of new victims to their death after confessions, that's in quote, had been beaten out of them. At one point, Stalin instructed the KGB interrogators to beat their victims again and again until they came crawling on their stomachs with their confessions between their teeth. Millions more were sent to be forced labor, uh, sent to forced labor camps of the Gulag to work and die as expendable slaves for building socialism. After Hitler came to power in 1933, the Nazi and Soviet regimes used their propaganda machines to condemn each other. But in fact, the two dictators learned from and secretly admired each other. After Hitler purged his rivals for power within the Nazi movement in the summer of 1934, known as the Night of the Long Knives, through murders and arrests, Stalin came into a meeting of his inner circle of subordinates in the Kremlin, slapped down a uh, copy of a Soviet newspaper reporting the events in Germany, and said that Hitler knows, this is in quote, Hitler knows how to take care of his enemies, end quote. Stalin soon let loose his own executions, purges, and show trials around the Soviet Union, clearly with Hitler's model in mind as an inspiration. The next section of this article, using Hitler as a means to Soviet ends. For Stalin, Hitler was a useful tool to start a second world war which Stalin wanted to trigger inevitable revolutions that would bring communism to power throughout Europe. Lenin believed that World War I served as the catalyst for weakening the capitalist nations through conflict among themselves. Out of their war with each other came the opportunity for a socialist revolution and the overthrow of the property-owning, quote, exploiters. The proof of this, according to Lenin, was shown by the success of his Bolsheviks coming to power in Russia in 1917 and maintaining their control over one-sixth of the land mass of the world when the war was over. Stalin accepted Lenin's view and believed that another equally exhausting new world war among those capitalist nations would enable the socialist revolution to be extended all the way across the European continent. In a secret speech before Communist Party members in 19. Uh, January 1925, Stalin said that the Soviet Union would not be able to stay out of a future war in Europe. But when action was taken by the USSR, it should be at the end of the conflict to tip the scales toward an outcome favorable for socialist world revolution. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but this is the argument that Sean McMeekin makes in his book, Stalin's War, that Stalin viewed the potential for World War II as an opportunity to have capitalist nations destroy each other. He was, early on, particularly in the 30s, an ally of uh, Germany, betrayed <laughs> Hitler in Germany. There is no honor among thieves, they say. 
and would, because of his ability to do so, uh, move into Poland. That's how he got control of so much of Poland, certainly running over uh, Ukraine and other countries in the Soviet Union, uh, taking power and control where he did not have it before. Uh, but he knew that he could only do that if capitalist nations, if nations like Great Britain and the United States and other free uh, countries did not push back. And the best way <laughs> to get them to not push back on him was to get them to fight each other and, more importantly, to fight Hitler. And so he stoked the war in uh, Europe. He stoked what was happening with the Nazis uh, across Europe and in Poland and in the other places that they had invaded. He supported uh, those in Japan who were moving into free regions in China. He did all of that subversively so that the United States and Great Britain in particular would be stretched so thin that they would have to support him coming in as the power that would allow them to end war with Germany. Um, absolutely amazing when you think about what Stalin was able to do, the precedent that he took from Lenin during World War I and his goals, which he held on to. I would encourage you to continue reading um, as much as you can about the Yalta Conference and the conversations that were having, uh, that were um, had there, but I'll continue reading this article. He points this out, and this is very important for us to understand. Soviet booty in Asia, he says. At Yalta, Stalin offered to enter the war against the Japanese three months after Germany was defeated, but only at a price. Now, I, I want to stop here real quick. Again, <laughs> uh, this is important. He, he doesn't mention this. Uh, the Soviet Union had already been involved with Japan in the war earlier in the 30s. Now, Stalin had been supporting um, both with troops and with finances what was happening in Japan. Um, so now he comes back and says, I'll get involved with Japan. I'll put an end to that. But there's a cost. He was playing both sides. Continuing here, oil field. The Soviet annexation of the Japanese-controlled southern half of Sakhalin Island with its oil fields and the strategic Kuril Islands north of the Japanese home islands. He also insisted that the Japanese military base at Port Arthur at the southern tip of Manchuria be transferred to Soviet control. Japan had acquired it in 1905 after the Russian defeat in the Russo-Japanese War. Finally, Stalin claimed Soviet jurisdiction over several of the major railway lines running through Manchuria. He insisted on all this booty in Manchuria without the Chinese government's prior knowledge or approval. We think of China as being the bad guys. At this time, Japan was the bad guy. China was not. <laughs> China was a large country. China was a country with deep and rich history. And China was a country that had freedom. It looked different than our democracy, our republic, but freedom. So Stalin was offering, in quotes, <laughs> to take control of many of the regions of China without the government of China's knowledge so that he could get involved to stop Japanese aggression uh, really throughout the Pacific. Soviet forces attacked the Japanese in Manchuria immediately after America dropped the atomic bomb in Hiroshima in August of 1945. At virtually no cost, Stalin gained control over a vast area of Northeast Asia. Shortly after the Soviet army overran Manchuria, Stalin had the industrial facilities of this part of China stripped and strip, uh, stripped and shipped to Siberia. Um, after the Japanese surrender, the Red Tsar allowed Mao Zedong's communist guerrilla forces to enter Manchuria. The Soviet army proceeded to turn over vast quantities of captured Japanese military equipment to the Chinese communists, helping to assure Mao's eventual victory on the Chinese mainland after defeating the Republican government of China in 1949. What happened in China, what is happening in China, the issues we're dealing with today because of communism in China were the result of primarily FDR's relationship with Stalin and allowing him to move throughout the world post-World War II. The drawing, a redrawing of areas of control during the Yalta Conference. FDR viewed Stalin and himself as the whole works. This next section. How did Roosevelt feel about determining the fate of the world with Stalin? FDR told a confidant, What helps a lot is that Stalin is the only man I have to convince. Joe doesn't worry about a Congress or a Parliament. He is the whole works. 
Roosevelt acted in the same near dictatorial manner. The Yalta agreements determining the future of countries and continents were all signed by FDR on the basis of executive power. Stop. Let's talk about that for a second. The basis of executive power. There was not a, po- a process that the President of the United States went through to sign over, literally, much of Europe to a communist dictator. Executive power. What we have seen in the last couple of years, for sure, is an abuse of executive power, not pushing major decisions that will impact us nationally, as well as the world globally, through a legislative process. We have legislative bodies, we have Congress, we have uh, our House of Representatives, we have our Senate, we have we the people, the voters, (laughs) and yet... None of the decisions that were made that are still impacting us today that have allowed communist, communism to run rampant around the world were pushed through a process of approval. Executive power. We need to be very careful at moments when a president feels as though he must use executive power. Why does he need to use executive power? Because he does not have consensus. I'll continue reading here, and we're almost done. In explaining the agreement to a joint session of Congress after returning from Yalta, Roosevelt said the future of Poland had been agreed to by Russia, uh, but by Britain and by me. I'm sorry, agreed to by Russia, by Britain, and by me. Even though in his negotiations with Russia and Britain, I didn't agree with all of it and did not always go as far as I want in certain areas, U.S. diplomacy and political comments affecting American citizens and taxpayers had become synonymous in FDR's mind with the personal pronouns of me and I. There is a section here, I won't continue to read, on FDR, the global planner, how he saw himself as the one who should redraw lines, but allowed Stalin to dictate to him how those lines would be drawn. Winston Churchill, an incredible wartime leader for sure, was in such a place that really what he could do is protest, and he did, but he had to go along in order to maintain the support of primarily the United States, but also the Soviet Union, to protect Great Britain. There is so much more that could be said on this, and I would love to read the rest of the article and spend much more time talking about it. But my point in reading this article, my point in bringing this up, is that what we learn from this event, a singular event, the Alta Conference, So many other conversations, by the way, were had, other conferences entered into, uh, agreements and policies absent the approval of the American people that impacted folks around the world. What we learn from this is that nothing, first of all, is new. There is, as Solomon said, no new thing under the sun. That people in power will always do what they need to to maintain power and to flex or demonstrate their power uh, to others. But that, if we are not willing to put the right people in place who understand representative government, who have a long view of history and not simply an expedient right now pragmatic view of history, if we are unwilling to make the hard decisions and do the hard things now that need to be done, then generations of not just Americans, but people around the world will bear the brunt of our pragmatism, expediency, and in many cases, laziness, <laughs> taking the easy way out, allowing those who have nothing to offer other than their desire for power to carry us forward. We must learn from history. It has been said I don't know who coined the phrase. It's been attributed to many people, but um, those who don't learn from history are destined to repeat it. Why is it that we look back historically and we understand that uh, humans, we could look more recently, Americans, continue to go through a cycle of prosperity, of bad decisions, (laughs) of government and political overreach, of economic depression, of despair, getting to a place where those who live at the time are fed up, throw off those politicians, re-embrace freedom, and go through the cycle again. Why does this happen again and again and again? 
Why does it seem like we live through the same scenario and the same situation? The dictator's names change, but nothing else changes. The situations are the same. Why? Because we're unwilling to look at what has happened even in our near recent future. Let's be committed as people who want to navigate well, who want to have the position, uh, the perspectives and information necessary to navigate well the culture that is changing around us. Let's be committed to looking to the past, learning lessons the easy way. That's the way we don't have to live through them. <laughs> and implementing those lessons today so that we can avoid the pitfalls, uh, avoid, uh, avoid the brokenness, and, and many times avoid uh, the genocide and the murder, and move forward in a good way. Learn from the past so that you can chart a prosperous path forward. Uh, such a, man, an important lesson. We're having conversations every day right now about what's happening in China. Every day right now, we're talking about Russia and what's happening in Russia. Uh, we don't understand history, so we don't even understand the relationship between Russia and Ukraine, let alone Russia, Ukraine, and the rest of the world and the rest of Europe. Why is it that Europe is allowing Russia to do what they're doing? Why did no one in Europe stand up until it got so bad that now they have to and they're out of uh, energy resources? Why? It's history. If we understood history, understood globalism from a historical perspective, we would make better decisions. We could inform others. We could make the case that we need to make to carry ourselves forward, but more importantly, to create a country of freedom that our children, our grandchildren, and future generations will enjoy. Uh, I hope you'll take some time to think on that. Nothing has changed my perspective on the present more than learning from the past. And uh, it can you as well. I appreciate you listening to this show. We do our best to cover as many issues as possible, to bring guests on as often as possible, and really to provide a framework for decision-making. Uh, we sincerely desire to provide the information and perspectives you need, I need, we need, to make the best decisions possible in a culture that is always changing. If you're like me, uh, you're at a point in your life where you feel like you can make it no matter what happens, regardless of how good or bad things get, you're going to make it. But if you're like me, you spend more time thinking now, today, uh, about your kids, about your grandkids, about those who are coming after us, and asking the question, not only how did we get here, <laughs> but what kind of country are we going to leave for those who are coming up behind us? And we need to ask that question so that we can set things up in a way that will give them every opportunity to be prosperous. And uh, this show works, uh, good or bad, <laughs> works toward that end. Really appreciate you listening. If you are not yet subscribed to the podcast, do it. Subscribe. Uh, that would be fantastic. Share this content out with others. Go to our YouTube channel. You can find us on YouTube. Look for The Situation Report, and uh, we'd love to have you join us there. Subscribe. Hit the notification bell. Leave us a comment, and uh, that would be fantastic. Thank you again for joining. Look forward to talking to you next time. MyPillow is excited to bring you their biggest bedding sale ever, and just in time for Christmas. For a limited time, get the Giza Dream Sheets for as low as $29.98, a set of pillowcases for only $9.98, and rejuvenate your bed with a MyPillow mattress topper for as low as $99.99. They also have blankets in a variety of sizes, colors, and styles. They even have blankets for your pets. Get duvets, quilts, down comforters, body pillows, bolster pillows, and so much more. All with the biggest discounts of the year happening now. They are also extending their money-back guarantee for Christmas until March 1st, 2023, making them the perfect gifts for your friends, your family, and everyone you know. So go to MyPillow.com and use promo code SITREP or call 1-800-870-0283. You'll get huge discounts on all MyPillow bedding products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets for as low as $29.98, and get all your shopping done now while quantities last. We were not made to live in isolation. Sadly, many of our veterans feel they need to fight their battles alone. This self-isolation has led to the staggering statistic of more than 20 veterans taking their lives every day. A lot of guys end up drinking, a lot of guys end up losing hope. Some of them will go to the VA and they'll try to get, you know, prescription medication just to help 
with PTSD, you know, they'll get pills for anxiety, they'll get pills because they can't sleep, now they'll get pills for depression before they know it, they're taking 12 different medications. And when it's not working out, these guys lose hope, and that's why there's 23 guys a day committing suicide. The mission of Mighty Oaks is to eradicate the veteran suicide epidemic and help our warriors change their legacies. As a result, we've been able to help over 4,000 veterans and first responders by equipping them with the tools they need to live the lives they were created to live. Everything they said just kept hitting me in the heart over and over and over again. It's like all the things that I didn't know that I needed to hear. And uh, I opened my heart to God that week, dude, and like, <laughs> I've been a different person ever since. Our faith-based, peer-to-peer approach has one of the highest success rates of any program available today, offering hope and understanding to those who need it most. We provide our programs and resources, including travel, at no cost to our warriors. I remember talking to a licensed uh, social worker who actually handed me a pamphlet to Mighty Oaks. So I went, and I'm glad I did. By aligning their lives to biblical principles, these men and women are able to lead their families, their communities, and our nation. Our mission is to serve and restore our nation's warriors and families who have endured hardship through their service to America and to help them find new life purpose through hope in Christ. It's your generosity that can make a difference in the lives of the men and women who have fought for our country and our freedoms. Now that they're home, don't let them fight alone. Learn more at MightyOaksPrograms.org.